Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. So this is another session of our Quantum Research Center seminar. And today um, I have the very big pleasure of having here uh, Professor Simon Groblacher uh, from, from the Kavli Institute of Nanoscience at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. And uh, it's a very special um, opportunity for me because uh, I know Simon since we were very young. Uh, Simon spent some time in Brazil, uh, some long time ago when we were in the, I was in the beginning of my PhD and Simon was in his master's. And I had the, the pleasure of being flatmate of him in Brazil in Rio. So I know Simon from very long ago and uh, and this is a great opportunity to, to share the advance that he's done. He's, he's been doing a, an amazing uh, job um, as a group leader in the Netherlands. Um, he, he did his master's degree at the University of Vienna in Austria, where he worked with Mar Markus Aspelmeyer and Anton Seidinger on quantum communication protocols in higher dimensions. Um, then he joined Oscar Painter's group in Caltech as a Marie Curie Fellow uh, in 2011 where he focused on optomechanical effects in photonic crystal cavities. And, um, and then he started his group in Delft, where he has been very, very successful. Um, he's, he has demonstrated, um, he, they have done amazing experiments on, on quantum states of mechanical system coupled to optics um, through the radiation pressure force. Um, and of course, he has received uh, prestigious prizes. He's a grantee of the European Research Council. Um, he got a BD grant from the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. And of course, he's publishing in the, in the major journals, including Nature and Science, Nature Physics and PRL. And uh, he's one of those guys that's very special, very nice guy, um, experimentalist that understands the theory too. So it's really a great pleasure to have him here. And um, yeah, so let's listen to what he has to tell us. So. Simon, so please uh, go ahead. You have more or less, let's make it, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes. Yeah. I will let you know, and then we can save 10 minutes for questions. Oh, something else for the audience. Uh, please um, raise your hands and I can unmute you to ask questions during the talk. Uh, Professor Groblacher uh, has told me that he's totally fine. Uh, he's, he's keen on being interrupted during the talk. So if, we, if you guys have questions, please don't hesitate. Or you can also write it in the Q&A um, icon if you want to for the end of the session, okay? So thank you so much, Simon, again, for being here. Go ahead. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Leandro, for inviting me. It's really good to see you, and it's it's very nice to, to be here, even though this is just online. Um, and as Leandro already said, like, please interrupt me. I, I really don't like talking to my screen by myself, so it's very nice to have some interaction and, and hear feedback from everyone. Um, let me actually start by sharing my screen, probably. That will help. Um, can you see my, my screen? Does it look okay? Okay, great. So as Leandro already said, like I'm, I'm in Delft. It's been now seven years or so. So I'll give you a little bit of an overview essentially of what, we, what we've been working on in, in Delft over these years and essentially what, we've been, what kind of experiments we've been doing with um, mechanical oscillators um, inside optical cavities. So this is, this is really just a very high level overview of what we, of what we work on in my, in my group. There's various different areas. Most of it is centered around this, this center part. Um, it's essentially a mechanical oscillator. I think you see you should see my mouse as well, right? That's my point. So this is mechanical oscillator here um, that has a frequency, of course, as a mass coupled to the environment. And then you see it's embedded in, an, in a cavity. And then through the radiation pressure force, essentially, you can, you can couple the light field to the mechanical motion, read out the, the mechanics, can create quantum states. And I'll talk about this in a little bit, how that works. So but this is like kind of the generic view of what we work on, optomechanics. And there's various different aspects of this. So on the top right here, you see we try to do essentially quantum experiments at room temperature um, with, with mechanical systems that are that are room temperature. And the challenge here is that they're that they're very hot. So there's a lot of thermal excitation that you have to overcome in order to create any quantum states. And we're not quite there yet, but we're getting we're getting close. So we have like like thermal occupations of like 20 phonons um, starting from like 10 to the 7 or so. So we try to get this really almost to the ground state and then ideally observe quantum effects. Um, then on the bottom right here is something um, which I like to call quantum sensing and it really has two aspects. So on the one hand, we, we try to, to see if we um, can improve sensing um, through getting mechanical system into quantum states, so improve on the classical sensitivity. 
And on the other hand, we, we try to essentially test quantum forces. Like in this experiment, for example, that I depict here, we have these two strings here in the middle and they are both coded in a, in a superconductor. And then essentially we look at the Casimir force between these two, between these two strings if we're above and below the TC of the, um, of the superconductor. And there's some interesting um, physics to be understood and, and measurements to be done. And this is kind of the quantum sensing route. And then on the, on the bottom left here, this is kind of a little bit of an oddball in my, in my group. We, we kind of like use the fabrication techniques that we developed for the other experiments and try to build um, scanning tunnel like microscopy um, tips. Um, essentially, instead of your standard tungsten tip, we, we try to um, microfabricate them and then functionalize them in order to, for other groups that actually do STM physics to use them in, in the experiments. And then on the top left is, is what I mostly talk about today is, is really um, observing quantum effects in mechanical oscillators. And we do this by cooling them down in a, in a dilution fridge to millikelvin temperature, and, and then um, prepare various different quantum states and use them for quantum information processing, essentially. Um, so a little bit just briefly, why do we do this? Why would we work with mechanical oscillators? And th there's really, um, I think, three main aspects. Well, um, they kind of evolve over time. They're still all there. But we really started out from um, trying to understand if there is a, a limit in terms of how big can you make an, um, a, a mechanical system, or in general, a system, and still observe quantum effects. So there's no, in principle, no boundary in, in, in quantum theory itself. And we just try to push the, the size and mass of these systems and still try to see if they can behave uh, according to quantum physics or if there's some sort of decoherence mechanism. So this is kind of the fundamental aspect. I already mentioned the next one. We try to improve the sensing capabilities of, of particular mechanical oscillators and, and see if we can improve that by, by using quantum states of mechanical oscillators. And the last but not least is, is now using a mechanical oscillator that, that is in a, in a quantum state for quantum information processing tasks. And I'm talking about like once you're able to generate entanglement, um, you can potentially also think about um, building a quantum memory or use this for various different um, interesting quantum information processing applications. And I'll get into this um, a little bit more in, in over, over my talk. Simon, so, <coughs> Simon, sorry to interrupt. There, uh, there's, a, there's somebody, Guillaume, you have a question or, or what is it? Uh, sorry. No, no, so, sorry, sorry. Oh, OK, sorry, because it was, I, I found it a bit too early for questions, but I, I saw you raising hands. Sorry, oh, Simon, to oh, go oh, ahead, good. please. No, no, I'm, I'm very yeah. happy also at this stage if, again, That's anything great. is unclear. If I'm too fast, too slow, also let me know. I'm happy to, to adapt. No, 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 please, this is audience. a beauty, beautiful introduction. Go ahead, please, great. take it easy. Yeah, um, thanks. Let me let me jump right into into kind of like the, the, the devices that we use. So what kind of, what, and if I say like mechanical systems, optomechanical um, um, cavities, essentially, what do we use? I mean. Typically, um, these kind of systems, it's, it's a beam. This is, um, as you see, on the order of like microns with like a few hundred nanometers width and typically a few hundred nanometers thick. We make them out of various materials. The workhorse um, with which we usually work is, is silicon. And then what we do is we, we create a photonic crystal cavity. So you see here, we essentially create a, um, a, just a, a periodic structure in, this, in the silicon beam that has a band gap at a certain um, frequency. We typically work at 1550 nanometers. And then we adiabatically change this, this shape here into a defect and then change it back into the mirror. So effectively you build what I, what I show you here. You have two mirrors left and right. And in the center you have, you essentially have a defect that allows for a certain wavelength or, or frequency to oscillate back and forth. And this is what it looks like in, in simulation. So you see, this is the fundamental optical mode um, and this is just an example from a measurement. It has a, has a resonance frequency around 15, 15 nanometers. It just lives inside this beam. Now, the interesting thing is that this, um, this kind of structure does not only allow you to create band gaps for photons, but at the same time for phonons, so for mechanical oscillations. So this resonance and picking. At
Hi. Um, Simon? I think Simon had some network issue. Maybe it was network, so he might. Okay, let's wait for, let's wait a second. Um, I was also having that issue. I was not sure it was my internet or, or Simon's. Um, let's wait a second. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm not sure what is. just happened. My Zoom just closed, I guess. <laughs> hi, hi, Simon. Thanks for coming back. Um, yeah, the, everything froze for okay <clears throat> for a minute, um, but I think now okay. now it, now it's okay. Now now I, I can hear you well and see you well. Um, no problem. Let's try again. I'm Let's, very sorry. This is no no. Pl this please is a, please. This is a this is a disadvantage of not being there in person. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, don't worry. Don't worry. Please take it. Take it no, easy. But, take it easy. Yeah. Can I can yeah, I also take the invite. can I. Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. worry. C can I also make the, take the chance to ask you a question about this, this, um, this, um, this nano beam? So, so what is it? So, what is it yeah. that you change from mirror to defect? It's the, what is it? The the shape a, of the. It's the a hole. defect. The yeah. hole. It's a hole. Okay, you you, the you hole, change the exactly. shape so of the hole. Exactly. Yeah. It's you change the the size and the shape. So, like you see, it's this is much more elongated here than these are much rounder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and and you want essentially what we do is we simulate like a single unit cell for this and we see oh it has a nice band gap around 1550 and then mm -hmm. we see we can draw like this fundamental mode into the band gap if we just do a right. unit cell of this and then we just think about okay then we just find a function that smoothly transitions from this mirror region into this defect region i see fantastic and okay cool that's all that's all we do it's, mm -hmm. it's quite quite straightforward what was the last thing that you that you heard before i froze and i think up? you can continue from here I think you can. Okay, it's great. it's it's useful for everybody if you just start from here again. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So I'll, essentially, I'll, I'll, I was... I'll give you I'll give you a couple of extra minutes. Please don't worry. <laughs> great. Okay. So essentially, what I was saying is you have very strongly co -like localized optical and field and and mechanical motion, so they interact quite quite nicely in the, in these structures. Um, and I already mentioned like it, we typically operate at fifteen fifty nanometers. This is kind of like a design choice we make just from the material and the, and the size of everything. Um, and then we we typically get optical quality factors of a few hundred thousand. So this is also a little bit how strongly do you couple to the device? Um, and this means like line widths, so optical line widths on the order of a few hundred megahertz, maybe gigahertz or so. And mm -hmm. the optomechanical interaction strength, so the optomechanical interaction rate is around a megahertz. So it's not in a strong coupling regime. It's, it's I don't know two orders, two and a half orders of magnitude away or so. But it's still very useful, and I'll show you how we can actually still use this. Um, interaction to create interesting quantum states of the of the mechanical oscillator. Oh yeah, and the mechanics itself has a has a typical frequency of five gigahertz and quality factors really very strongly depend on temperature. So if we measure this at room temperature, we have a few thousand. If we go down to millikelvin temperature, we get a few million. And if we actually add an extra shield, an extra phononic isolation shield, we can get up to 10 to the nine or 10 to the 10 Q at low temperature. So it's really a big range that you can actually choose where, where you want to operate. Now, um, this is just a, a very, very quick intro in, in how this whole optomechanics business works in, in, in theory. So this is just a Hamiltonian. You see you have the free, um, the free optical part here, the free mechanical. So A is for optics and B is for mechanics. And um, here is essentially on the very right is the coupling of the extra cavity field to the intra cavity field. And now the interesting part of the Hamiltonian is actually interaction, of course, between mechanics and optics. And you see you couple the intensity of the light field to the position of the mechanical oscillator. And the coupling rate is this G naught that I already showed you what it is in, in, our, in our specific devices. And you can essentially think of the coupling rate as the change of the cavity frequency with, um, with respect to the change of the, of the length of the cavity um, times the zero point fluctuation. So it's how much does the cavity frequency change if you displace your mechanics by the zero point fluctuation effectively. And zero point fluctuation for a, a real um, mechanical system you can imagine is, is quite small. So typically 10 to the minus 15 meters or so. So the coupling rate can also be very, very small. In our case, it's actually not so bad because everything is so small in the, in the wavelength cubes and very strongly interacts with one another, but it's still not strong coupling simply because it's so hard to overcome the zero point fluctuation that limits really your, your interaction strength. But now in order to, to do something interesting is what we do is we, we don't use few photons or single photon states, but we actually use strong coherent pump 
field. So we essentially pump the cavity with a strong laser and then you enhance your interaction um, by the intracavity photon number squared. So essentially here by the, by the coherent state amplitude. And um, this unfortunately gets rid of this really nice nonlinear interaction, which would be nice to create interesting states. And effectively what you end up with, with is, a, is a linearized interaction. You, you can do a rotating wave approximation and you see depending on the detuning of the input field with respect to the cavity, you either get this two mode squeezing term or you get this beam splitter interaction. So you can really choose by detuning for example, um, to plus or minus the mechanical frequency, you can choose what kind of interaction you have in the, in the system. And this is also very simply understood. If you, if you think about the, the cavity um, response function here in black, um, we pump the, la so we, the, the lasers in green here. We pump, for example, the higher frequency than the cavity. Um, you get sidebands, so Stokes and anti-Stokes sideband. And in this case, you enhance the Stokes sideband and you suppress the anti-Stokes sideband. So you effectively get this two-mode squeezing interaction. Um, and this, this also means you kind of like, you're putting energy into the mechanical system. The opposite is true if you pump at lower frequency than the resonance, and then your anti-stoke side then gets enhanced and you actually extract energy from the, from the mechanical oscillator. So you cool it effectively and people have used this also to, to cool the mechanical system to the ground since it's kind of like a laser cooling. But the nice thing is because it's a beam splitter, you can also use this as a state swap, which is, which is quite um, useful also in experiments that we have. So this is really the, the basic setting of, of, of all the experiments that we do. And this has actually led us to, this is just a quick overview to some really interesting experiments. So we're able to, to create um, quantum states of the mechanical oscillator and we're able to create entanglement between two mechanical oscillators. And I'll, I'll go in more detail through these experiments in my next slides. We're also able to, to actually create entanglement between the mechanics and the optical field. Then we, we use very similar structures to essentially convert microwave frequency in, um, quantum information to optical domain and back. Um, and we can also use the mechanical system as a quantum one. So these are just a few of the, of the experiments we've been doing over the past few years. And this is all enabled by these um, optomechanical photonic and phononic crystal structures that we use by these nanobeams effectively. Just for different applications, we use different materials. So typically for these, for these main quantum experiments, we use silicon. Um, for the um, microwave to optics conversion, we use um, Pierce electric material like gallium arsenide or gallium phosphide. And again, I will, I will discuss this in more detail in the, in the, um, over the following slides. Now, just this is this is really just to, to drive home the point how, how simple in principle the whole system is and how powerful this is to, to do interesting quantum experiments. So what we have is we have a mechanical oscillator, now ideally in its ground state, so it's a harmonic oscillator. And if we now pump, we send in a strong short optical pulse that is blue detuned, so higher, higher frequency than the optical resonance. On average, not much will happen. We choose this power to be such that on average, it, the mechanics stays in the ground state and, uh, and the pump field stays the same, just gets, gets reflected out again. But every now and then you scatter a, so a Stokes photon and that means you increase the mechanical excitation by one. So you go to a single photon Fox state and at the same time you create a photon on resonance with the, with the cavity. And there's a probability, this probability squared that you create an, a second, um, uh, second order um, Fox state and you get two photons on resonance with the cavity, right? So effectively what you do is you have a two mode squeezing interaction, right? This is the Hamiltonian that we have. Now, if you look, if you're able to look on resonance, so if you're able to detect photons that are on resonance with the cavity, so these green photons here that we create and you have a single photon detector and you know that you, so you detect a single photon and you know that it's only a single photon, what you effectively do is you trace over the vacuum state and you trace over all higher order states and you effectively project the mechanical system into a single phonon box state. So this is all we do. So we have, we shift the nonlinearity that we would need to create a quantum state. So this discussion initial um, harmonic oscillator state into a single phonon Fox state. We shift the nonlinearity from the initial Hamiltonian because now we have a linearized Hamiltonian because we use strong fields to yeah. the detection. Hello, question? Yes? Yeah, question, just to, to, to understand, to be sure yeah. that I, I, so you, call squeezed states uh, just the two photon just whenever you just make a two uh, so i'm referring to the to third the uh, yeah, yeah to the this third one. so one yeah. whenever you have any transition which involves two photon you call squeeze states it's a it's a two most squeeze state right so you it's a pairwise production of photons and phonons yeah so it's yeah so, exactly and you are sure that actually this is just coherent so it's a squid state, it's just not simply two photons that are incoherent. 
Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So these okay. only like you, you only so you see you always it's a pairwise production. You create the, the photon if a photon gets scattered on resonance with the cavity, mm -hmm. this only this process only happens if you also create a phonon um, in the in your mechanical oscillator. The same is true if you create two phonons. It's only possible if you actually in your anti-Stokes process create two photons. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, Simon, is it similar to the photon per production? Yes, it's exactly in, the same in, Hamiltonian. Yeah, it's exactly it the same Hamiltonian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks. We, we, thanks, Luigi, for the question. We use quantum optics tools to do optomechanics, quantum optomechanics. That's which fantastic. Is, which is quite nice, it's exactly. And fantastic. then we do the same tricks. Yeah. We essentially detect single photons. We project the mechanical system into, into a single phonon proxy. And now we have this other Hamiltonian, we have the beams with the Hamiltonian, and this we can then just use to really verify that we created a single phonon state by simply sending in now a retitune pulse. And we can make this actually very strong. So the probability is very high of anti stoke scattering. And then if the mechanical system was really in a single phonon state, we would create a photon again on resonance and de-excite the mechanical system back into its ground state. Okay? So this is, it's, it's, the concept is very simple. The experiment's a little bit more complicated, but it's, it's a very powerful tool to use um, nonlinearities, detection nonlinearities to create quantum states of a mechanical system. Now, the way this, this looks like in reality is um, we have this, this dilution fridge that can cool down to, to about 10 millikelvin or so. And then we take our chip. This is, this is the, the top view of our, of our device. Um, and we have this, this central waveguide here. So essentially, we come here now from the left side with an optical fiber. It's a lensed optical fiber. We send, we couple through the, from this lensed optical fiber into this waveguide. Efficiency is, I don't know, 70% or so. And the photons, so that the photon pulse can travel down the waveguide. And then you see we have two of these nano beams. We have two. I should actually change the picture to just one. It's, there's no deeper meaning why we have two. It's simply because we want to save some space and it's symmetric. They have slightly different resonance frequencies. So we can just choose which one we want to work with by changing the, the, the wavelength of the input light. And then the waveguide itself also has a mirror here. And so all the light that essentially interacts with one of these nano beams gets reflected out again into the fiber. And then we can detect the, the light in the, in the fiber. Now, if you now remember my, my starting point before is the mechanical system is, is in its ground state. So we have actually have to verify it, even though this is, this is five gigahertz, 10 millikelvin means in principle, there should only be about 10 to the minus five or so um, thermal excitations in the mechanical system at 10 millikelvin. However, in reality, that's not always the case. Um, so we really have to verify that the mechanics is in a ground state. And we, we use exactly this, these um, optomechanical interactions to actually check that. So we, what we do is we essentially realize these um, um, ladder operators that you used to from, from harmonic, um, from quantum mechanics 101 from the, um, from the harmonic oscillator. Uh, and this is simply the, the blue detuned pulse is a ladder operator that increases the phonon state while the retitune is, is decreasing it, of course. And if you're in a ground state, you cannot decrease it any further. So there should be an imbalance between the, the probability of these processes happening. And this is exactly what you see here. So um, you see it's very easy to excite the, the mechanics, but it's almost impossible to de-excite it. And the ratio between these two processes actually gives it a direct measure of the thermal occupation of the mechanical system. And in this case, it was about 0 0.025. So it's, it's not as cold as, as we wish it was, but this is simply because there is some this imperfect um, coupling to the, to the fridge bath. There's, there's some heating from the laser. So you don't get to 10 to the minus 5, but you actually only get to, get to 0 0.02, which is about, I think, 60 or 70 millikelvin or so effective temperature. But it's good enough to say it's in a ground state, at least for an experimentalist. And then we, so in principle, we're ready to, to use this now to, um, to do some quantum experiments. And I, I'll skip over the, the first one, the, the, the single phonon creation, because you've already, already seen this, you already know how this works now. Um, but let's jump right into, into creating an entangled state. So this very same interaction we can use um, to, to create an entangled state between two mechanical oscillators. And the way this works is now we take two of these, um, of these um, nano beams we put them in, in the cryostat, so we cool them down into the, into the, into the ground state. And then what we do is we put them in an interferometer. So essentially, we, we send in this blue tuned pulse onto a beam splitter. The, the, the pulse gets split up, um, interacts with both of the devices, and then we, we recombine the paths on a, on a beam splitter. And now if these two devices are perfectly identical, so if photons that are actually created in this, in this optomechanical interaction are indistinguishable on this beam splitter, and we detect a single photon in one of the detectors, we know that one of the two is excited, but we don't know which one is excited. And that actually means we created an entangled state. And if you look at the, just the math a little bit, um, you see here, so what we do is we actually create 
two two mode squeeze states, and then we detect a single photon. So this is this is how we perform the experiment. And what happens if we detect a single photon? We trace over vacuum, we trace out the photon, of course, and we actually are only left with an excitation, a mechanical excitation that is shared between the two um, oscillators. So the state actually looks like this. And this is, of course, an entangled state. Um, we cannot, in principle, say from which of the mechanical oscillators the photon came from. And therefore, we have to say it's actually shared between the two. The um, verification. Si si Simon, can yeah. I ask you something? Yeah. I have, a very, I have a very basic question. So, mm. so, OK, so these are like photonic crystals, right? And mm -hmm. so what, what mm -hmm. goes through there is this electromagnetic field, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then you're, you're talking about mechanical oscillators. Yeah. But what, what is mechanical about this? Like, is it, is it not a photonic crystal? And, and then it's, it's, a, it's a photonic mode there that you're playing with? Or is it also the, the mechanic, the phononic mode? Like, yeah. so, sorry, I, I think you mentioned this already, but so, somehow so I, really, I... Yeah, no, 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 that's a good question. This, this is important to understand because otherwise the rest of the talk doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, so so it's, it's, it's both of... So this, these devices, they essentially host both um, optical and the mechanical resonance and you see the optical one is this one at, at 1550 here mm -hmm. here this is this the simulation of this one which is which is corresponding to this to this trace here and then at the same time there's like just because i mean it's it's a it's a freestanding structure it can oscillate it can vibrate it also has a mechanical motion that is actually at so, five gigahertz so, so the, pos the position the position of the holes itself changes exactly they, they, they okay. okay yes so okay. so it's it's obviously very small like in the ground state it's 10 to the minus 15 meters but we're sensitive enough with our optics that we can actually see this and this is all this um optomechanic interaction strength g naught is about right so okay. we, we, wow. we we know that we so this whole process like um is essentially it's really this generic view here so you have a mechanical motion it slightly elongates or slightly changes the the resonance condition of the of the optical cavity and so you can couple these two together. And Fantastic. You detect the mechanical motion in the optical output field. But it, but is the is the mechanical mode always correlated with the sorry the phononic mode always correlated with the photonic mode or you can do different things like is it like it was two different degrees of freedom or do they always behave kind of correlatedly or no they're, they're independent in principle independent. right okay um, okay. So, but right. this is but, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, but you can you can couple them together through this optomechanic interaction. So it's actually moving boundaries of this and and some some strain coupling. Um, but but in principle, yeah, they they, they coupled um, through the radiation pressure force effectively to one right. another. Yeah? Right. Thank you. Great. No, of course. All right. So yes. So we, we essentially we we control the mechanical motion through an optical pulse. So we have them interact through this optical pulse and we can just change the tuning and choose the, the interaction that we, that we have between the mechanics and the optics. All right. Okay, so then now we're, we're back here. So essentially now we created an entangled state um, between the, the two mechanical states. And the interesting thing is they're not on the same chip. They're actually physically apart and just sit in the same, in the same interferometer. They're like in the same fridge as well but like on opposite side of the fridge. And, and we created this the single phone that is shared between the two oscillators. Now, in order to actually verify that we actually created an, an entangled state, it's a little bit more involved. Um, and the reason for that is, so what we do is again, we, we send in a retitune pulse. So we actually um, make a state swap between the mechanical excitation and, and the optical field. And then what we do is we, we measure cross correlations essentially between, um, between the first pulse and the second pulse for various different settings of the phase in the interferometer. That actually allows you to, to um, measure this entanglement witness here. There's more details on, on, this, on, on, on this in these papers. And effectively, what, what this does is um, it checks. So if these um, correlations are, are stronger than a, classical, um, than a classical system would have, then this um, entanglement witness would always be greater than one. But if you actually see that this entanglement witness is below one, you can actually demonstrate that this is really an entangled state between the two mechanical states. And the reason why we why we don't have something simpler, for example, at Bell inequality, is is because we only share a single excitation, so we cannot measure in different bases effectively. So it's 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 a little bit more. Yeah, the, the details are unfortunately not. It's not that nice that we we can really measure a nice Bell inequality. We, we've done a Bell inequality, but this is in a, in a slightly. Um, different, it, it works a little bit differently and I'll show you um, on, in, in a couple of slides. So, right, so we have to essentially um, 
get below this bound in, in order to demonstrate that we that we really um, have entanglement between the two oscillators. Now, I mentioned it's, it's really important that the, um, that the two um, systems are really identical. Um, otherwise, you would actually be able to tell from which one, from which of the two oscillators the, the photon comes. And you see here, these are the, the optical um, resonances of the two of these two devices. Um, so these are perfectly the same. The mechanics is a little bit different. It's it's different, I think, in this case by like I think 50 megahertz or so, something on that order. But you can compensate for this by actually um, detuning the the light field um, differently in one of the arms for the blue and the red detuned pulse, just making sure that the photons that are coming out are exa exactly identical. So essentially, you do some um, which path um, information. You so you erase the which path information by applying a, a different a different frequency shift on the two on the two pulses. Well, and then we, we do this experiment. So we just vary the phase, we look at the visibility, and then we, we essentially just calculate this entanglement witness. And in our initial experiment, we managed to, to get it significantly below one. Um, by now we improved the setup. So initially it, it took us quite some time, a lot of statistics. This is relatively inefficient. It took us about a, a day to, to measure each of these data points. Um, we're now able, I think, to do this whole thing in, in about 10 hours and we get much better values. So we really have a much nicer entanglement, much better entanglement production rate. Um, it, it works really well. Um, and there's actually now a tool for us to check if, if devices are really the same um, in order to, to do a little bit more complicated experiments. All right, and I already mentioned, I promised you a bell inequality. Um, now the, the hard part, as I said, is, is having a bell inequality between the two mechanical oscillators because they only share a single excitation. But what we can do is we can actually violate a bell inequality between the two mechanical oscillators and the optical field. So there's entanglement, of course, before you detect the single photon between the two mechanical oscillators and the two modes, the two optical modes that are coming. And you can change the, the measurement setting by change the, the phase in the interferometer. And you can really measure all the different angles uh, for the correlation coefficients of the, of the CHSH inequality, for example. And this is effectively what we do. And, and we really see this nice entanglement between the optical field that actually generate the, the phonons and the phonons themselves. So this, is, this was also quite, um, we were quite happy with this. I think now we, we really have to see, can we, can we go to a different basis? Can we maybe use higher order um, excitations in the mechanics to also really um, create an entangled set that we can use, to, like a mechanical entangled set we can use to divide the bell inequality. But that's something for the future, I think for now. We're able to violate the bell inequality, the optomechanical bell inequality only. All right. Um, so this is this is kind of an, an entry and and the first experiments um, we did in terms of um, in terms of these um, quantum um, states of mechanical oscillators. Now the idea is that we we want to use this as a resource for for in, interesting quantum information processing. And of course, you know, it's there's always a, a big question like how how can you bridge big distances um, in, in quantum communication. And one thing you need to do is you need to build a quantum repeater essentially in order to, um, to um, bridge large distances in order to communicate over, over larger distances. And the idea is now, if we have, for example, two entangled states of, of two harmonic oscillators, we could do a bell state measurement between two of them. And of course, create an entangled state between the, the two outer parts that never interacted with one another. Um, so we're really, we're really looking at how can we build a, a quantum repeater effectively. And in order to do this, what you actually need is a, is a quantum memory first. So you need to be able to store one of the states, especially with, this, with, the, with the protocols that we have because they're inefficient, um, they don't always work. So we have to be able, if you're successful, to actually store your state and wait for the other side also to be successful and only then um, do the bell state measurement. And um, so in order to really increase the lifetime of the mechanical oscillators, um, we add this, this um, phononic shield here. So this is just this cross structure. And here you see the band gap calculation for, for essentially one of these um, unit cells here. And you see this is a really nice full phononic um, band gap between four and six and a half gigahertz or so. And we use this cross structure, the shield to surround a nano beam. And this actually completely attenuates any phonons leaking out of the system. So the original here, the, the, the phononic um, band gap here is, is good, but it's not a full phononic band gap. There's some symmetry breaking essentially that allows you to phonons to leak. But with this shield, you can really completely isolate the system. And this allows you um, to get up to like this 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 Q um, in, these, in these structures. We choose something a little bit smaller because um, otherwise it takes way too long to measure. Um, so we chose, um, I think, a, a Q 
10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, something on that order. So. And then what we did is we essentially looked at um, the, um, the second order correlation, um, so the cross correlation between the optics and the mechanics, and looked how they decayed over time. And you see that the T1 time is really nice. You, you can actually just, you're essentially lifetime limited by the, by the mechanical quality factor. So you see it's, it's very nice, very large G2 values um, until about um, a microsecond and it starts sloping off. The, this this um, light yellow shaded area is essentially how long can you divide the bell inequality. So this is up to almost a, a microsecond or so. And then below here is essentially just a classical bound. Um, so T1 is nice. Um, that works actually really well. We, we really, um, the lifetime limited. However, then we looked at our T2 star. So how long can you essentially store the, the phase of a, of, a, um, of a quantum state in there? So we essentially created a superposition state between zero and one. We wrote it into the mechanical system and then looked at how long can we still retrieve this, this superposition state. And you see this is about one to two orders of magnitude smaller than the, than the, T2, T, than the T1 time. Um, and it's only yeah, tens or hundreds of, of microseconds. And at first we were a little bit puzzled, but then we, we looked at um, essentially the mechanical oscillator's frequency itself. And we noticed that the mechanical oscillator, even though it's a 10 millikelvin, it actually jitters very slightly, ever so slightly the frequency of the mechanical oscillator jitters. And that actually gives you a dephasing of your, of your state. And this is essentially some data over, over many hours. So you see this is really just the central frequency of the mechanical oscillator by itself just fluctuates. And it's not entirely clear where this comes from, but we do think this is essentially a coupling um, of the mechanical mode of this five gigahertz mode to some surface states or so of the silicon. So there seems to be some, some two level fluctuation fluctuators that couple um, to a mechanical oscillator and just ever so slightly drive it a little bit and, and make the frequency not be super stable. And this really is reducing our, our T2 star time um, a little bit. All right, any, I guess no questions so far then I'll I'll just continue. There's more to show. <laughs> so now we, we essentially, we, we, have this, we have this kind of quantum memory. So we, we thought, okay, what's really the next step um, towards a, a proper quantum repeater, um, which eventually um, we would like to realize, of course. And so the very basic unit cell effectively of a, of a quantum repeater is quantum teleportation. So have, a, have an unknown um, quantum state and you essentially teleport this um, from one side to the other. And mm -hmm. of course, it would be nice to um, to have like one of the mechanical systems as, as an input state. But again, we have this issue with only having a single phonon shared between the two oscillators. So what we do is we again use the optomechanical entanglement. And you see here, so we create an, an entangled state first between the two mechanical oscillators and um, the, opti the two optical modes, which we now encode in, in a polarization um, basis. And then we send in an unknown quantum state, also encoded in a polarization basis, we do a bell state measurement between the two optical paths, so four optical modes, or actually it's, it's um, three optical modes. And then this state here gets teleported onto the state of the mechanical oscillators. Okay, so that's kind of the idea. Um, so of so Simon, you, you, te you teleport a photonic state on the one side to a, to a phononic state on the other side, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. But the, the bell state measurement is on the, on the photonic degree of freedom. Yes. Yeah, and then exactly. you do local interaction uh, between phonon and photons, right? Uh, yes, or, effectively. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's right. exactly. So we have as a resource, we have an entangled state between two mechanical oscillators and two optical modes, and then we send in an, an unknown optical input state. We make a bell state measurement between this um, the the optical part of the entangled state and the and the input state. And therefore teleport the um, the unknown input state onto the mechanical oscillators, and so I think uh, there's obviously been a lot of work on on, on teleportation, and um, you, I'm sure you all know that um, that there's a, a classical limit, of course, and if we overcome this, we can really show that we that we effectively have, have quantum teleportation here. Now this is this is what the experiment looks like. So we create this entangled state as a, as a resource. We prepare um, the the unknown um, input state, we do the bell state measurement um, optically, and then we actually send in a, a retitude pulse in, onto the, the, two, um, the two mechanical oscillators. So similar when we, when we did the entanglement verification and read out the state of the two, um, of the two oscillators and verify that the initial state that we had encoded here in the photon is actually then lives, um, or we, we could actually teleport this onto, onto the mechanical oscillator. 
And we do this for various different bases. So we, we obviously, we, it's not an unknown state, but we know what the state of the input photon is. And we just vary the, the, the different encoding. We go from horizontally polarized to vertically polarized to diagonal. So H plus V to, to, left, um, to left circular polarized, which is H plus IV. And um, because of um, time limitations, and, and this already took about a month of measurement or so, um, we didn't measure the, the um, H minus V or the um, H minus IV, but they're exactly symmetric with the DNL. But in the average calculation, we actually took these values twice and we get a fidelity that is um, about 75%. Um, so this is significantly higher than the, than the classical bound of, of um, two thirds. And therefore we actually can demonstrate that we can really teleport this optical state onto the mechanical systems. Um, I have a, essentially a slightly different part on, on microwave to optics conversion, but I'm not sure how much, how much time I have. And so, um, I think he, I think it's okay. Like 10 more minutes or okay. yeah, that's no, fine. I, I also don't mm -hmm. want to, I think if there's questions, this is also a good moment for, for people to ask questions. I don't want to overwhelm people, um, with, with too many so, different so, things. So here, so here, let, let me ask you something. Yeah. So, so here the, the, there's not a, there's not a great physical separation between the two, the two nodes where, where you're teleporting, right? No, absolutely not. No. And, yeah. and, and, and let me, something else. So then you mentioned that, I mean, the state that you create, that you create is like you have entanglement on the, on the photonic level, at the photonic level, and also entanglement at the, at the phononic level. Right. But then you make a bell state measurement only in the photonic degree of yes. freedom. Right. Yes. So in principle, you wouldn't need entanglement at the phononic level for your yeah. teleportation, would you? No. So, so here, this, this is, this is the state that we produce here. Right. So we have, vacuum in the um in the optical modes and this is it's a little bit yeah this is this is like a, a, essentially a two mode state this 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 optical part and then you see the two oscillators the mechanical oscillators then because we send in this blue tune pulse which with a probability pv um we get an horizontal um photon out and the the first oscillator in in, in the vacuum state and the second one in the first excited um fox state and then the opposite, if we get a vertical photon out, then the mechanics mm -hmm. is in this state, right? Okay. So this is, and mm -hmm. then of course, higher orders. And then we, and then we do the bell state measurement on the optical HV part. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I think that Rene, Rene raised his hand. Yes. Um, yeah. Rene, yes, please. Yeah. So if you're in the um, question now regarding what you said before, Simon, mm -hmm. um, about um, the surface state coupling and the mm -hmm. reduced T to star time. So how, so what does this exactly mean? So at the surface, there's some kind of dangling bond, bonds. Yes. And, yeah. and then those would change as a function of time or those are stable, but somehow coupled to your system. Or how, how can I imagine this in terms of a microscopic picture? What's, what's happening? Yeah, I th okay. So, so first of all, I want to say, I think <laughs> two level systems are always a good excuse if you don't know what's going on in, in experimental physics, <laughs> because they're, they're, very, they're very hard to explain, um, at least like what they really um, physically do. Um, what we do see is that there seems to be some some jittering in the, in the frequency. We also see that there is some some surface state, some two level systems on the surface, um, because um, some of the light actually that we that we send in gets absorbed by these and then couples to the phonons, so they create a phonon bath. And we actually think these are dangling bonds on the on the surface of the silicon that just come from fabrication. So when when we terminate the the silicon surface, there's some there's some hydrogen termination, and essentially these these seem there seem to be some defects and dangling bonds. And they, I think they just, they're just not stable in time. They just change their, their configuration, they, they change and therefore create a, I don't know, a strain field or I don't know how they really couple physically, but probably through, through strain um, and then, and then change the, the whole configuration of your, of your mechanics and just, just change the frequency effectively. Okay. And you, what is an, is there a strategy how to get rid of those or how to mitigate this? Could we right. like, I don't know, freeze it out or so? Or do you see if you reduce the temperature, then I guess they would change less or? Possibly, or, we, we just can't go lower than 10 millikelvin, unfortunately, <laughs> at least not, not very easily. Um, I think, so, so our current strategy is to, to try to um, create different surface um, states, so different surface preparations. So instead of like this final hydrogen termination, we. We, we're trying oxygen termination or aluminum oxide. There's like a bunch of different um, things you can do in, in, in fabrication to, to try to, to terminate these and, and see how good it is then. Um, this, is, this is just ongoing, ongoing tests. It's, it's very, it, it takes a very long time. It's very 
hard to directly compare because every system is a little bit different and ideally you want to have like two systems that are perfectly the same in order to verify if actually you're doing better yeah um, but but i think there, there there's also there's also been approaches of of going away from uh, from these um 1d structure right so effectively this 1d nano beam to a 2d structure so have like something that is more attached to the surroundings and and potentially create a better thermal link to the to the environment and and therefore like reduce um reduce heat load or maybe freeze out the, the states better so this is the, the, there's there's various different approaches that we that we're trying and and we'll see we're hopefully going to solve this at some point Super. Thanks a lot. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Rene. That's a question I also wanted to ask, <laughs> but I was not brave enough to ask it being a peer edition. Uh, uh, Simon, before you change topics, I have some yeah. questions here written in the Q&A um, mm. section. So one of them is technical from Rea Fernandez. He, uh, yeah. She says, uh, what software is used for the simulation? I think that what is meant here in the, the initial simulation where you simulate yeah. the modes. The, oh, we, the we phononic use, and photonic modes. Yeah, we use console. So that's that's so just a very standard. That's standard, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and then there was another question. Oh, okay. There are two more questions. Hold on. So another question from by Cordette. Uh, is your mechanical mode related to stimulated brilliant scattering? I don't know. This is something too technical for me. I don't know if. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, not. I mean, they're, they're related in a sense, they're, they're similar, but not the same. Um, so stimulated, so Brillant scattering in general, like you, you have you have propagating um, waves, right? Here you have a resonant mode. So it's it, it's not it's not quite the same, mm -hmm. but it's, okay. it's definitely very related. And this is also like, mm -hmm. there's, there's quite a big field of like quantum quantum mechanics, like Brillant scattered quantum optomechanics, which is, mm -hmm. which is related, but not quite the same. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. And then the last question here. Uh, thank you. For, so this is from Bolus, um, from from our center. He says, "Thank you for the talk. It's quite interesting. What type of silicon you use for the photonic waveguide crystal? You mentioned it is coated, right? The crystal is embedded in silicon, in silicon, assumingly edge, which is lossy. Can you tell us more about this type of coating and how it allowed you to achieve such high Q factors?" Okay, so so actually the the silicon itself is is not coated. So we, we started from a silicon on insulator wafer. So we have silicon on oxide on on silicon, and it's just a very thin top layer, which is like this essentially what we make this devices of. So it's about two hundred and fifty nanometers thick. It, it's it's obviously single crystalline um, silicon. It's it's even doped, which is not ideal, but we have not seen any difference if it's if it's at least high resistivity. So this is relatively low resistivity silicon, quite standard to buy. Um, and then we, we simply um, etch, so we, we do even lithography, we do an etch into the silicon, and then we undercut it in, in hydrofluoric acid. And in principle, we don't, so th that's also why I say like it's terminated with, with hydrogen. Um, it's, it's from this, this hydrofluoric acid undercut. There's, some, there's a very thin layer that's, that, that stays on there. This is not a coating that we necessarily want. Um, there is always a little bit of native oxide on there. So whenever you take it out of your processing, immediately there's, there's some native oxide, so silicon oxide. Um, and now we, we're actually trying to, to put different, different films on top. But in general, there's, there's no film on there. Okay, so it's just, cool. just standard silicon. Right. So there are more people raising hands, OK? So mm -hmm. Luigi, you, you are cool. unmuted. And then Abdullah, I will allow you to talk to, okay? But first, Luigi, go ahead, please. Yes, yeah, so actually, um, my question is not scientific question. So uh, it's uh, on the organization. So will we have a question mark at the end of the talk or just, uh, or, or we are at the end of the talk? No, no, we're not at the end of the talk. If it's non-scientific, let's perhaps leave it for the end. No, 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 I, I think, think I, have, I have many questions, but I think I would like to ask, uh, to, to ask uh, at the end of the talk. If I okay. I'm okay. totally fine. I'm happy to answer yeah. later as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Ab Abdullah, do you want to ask something at this point? Abdullah, are you there? Sorry, Leandro, my uh, my hand was raised by, by by mistake. Oh, okay, no problem. Yeah, no, problem. no worries. Okay, cool. That's great. Thanks. Um, thank you for the questions, guys. So I'm I'm happy to continue for your next part, Simon. Okay, please. Great. Good. Yeah. So. That's, so this is this is now um, about this this microwave to optics conversion. I already mentioned it briefly. So essentially, the the challenge here is now um, to all of you are aware, very well aware. There's like 
quite big companies trying to build quantum computers, superconducting qubits. Um, they all operate at microwave frequencies. Um, so they can't really travel very far. So they're kind of bound to, to the cryostat where they live in. Um, but it would be really nice to get this, this quantum information out and build a quantum network, like a, a kind of quantum internet. So here the idea is to, to translate microwave quantum information to optical um, quantum information. And it's about five orders of magnitude different frequency. So it's quite challenging. There is, there is approaching approaches of doing this directly. So what I show here, microwave resonator coupled to an optical resonator, for example, lithium niobate, you have like an ele electro-optic modulator, uh, nonlinear interaction between, um, between um, microwave fields and, and, and optics. Um, that works in principle, it's not very efficient. And one of the main challenges is that it's actually very noisy. Um, so it's, 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 it's a big challenge. And our approach now in, um, to do this is actually to add a mechanical oscillator in between. So we couple microwaves to mechanics and then to optics. And at first, this, this seems like a bad idea, right? You're adding more complexity to your, to your problem. Um, but if you look at um, some of the, the interesting parameters, it actually is, is, quite, is quite interesting to do. So first of all, what you do is you add um, two. So instead of one interaction, now you have, you have two interactions. So you have a piezoelectric interaction, for example, between microwave and mechanics. And then this radiation pressure interaction that I've been talking about so far. And the interesting um, quantity here is now is the cooperativity. So it's how strongly do these interact essentially. And so um, essentially here you have the, the electromechanical interaction squared over the, the decay rates of the mechanics and the, um, and the microwaves. And the same, of course, for the optomechanical part. And in order to, to do interesting quantum conversion between a microwave and the optics, you actually need to need to increase your efficiencies, and this is kind of the formula that you that you have to maximize effectively. And the good thing now is, so so you can also write this down for direct microwave to optics. Um, the the good thing here is that you can now you see that um, in both of these um, cooperativities, you actually have the mechanical line width in there, and mechanical line width you can make really really small, so you can actually increase these cooperativities quite a bit. So you can really boost your efficiency by using a mechanical oscillator. And you can actually use different coupling mechanisms, which, which is interesting because there's not a lot of good materials that have like a, a high um, nonlinearity that allow you direct conversion between microwave and optics. But there's quite a few piezoelectric materials and radiation pressure you can almost use in, in, in almost any system. So that's, that's, that's quite good. So this is kind of just a quick motivation. There's obviously a little bit more details to this why we think microwave to optics conversion using the mechanical intermediary is actually interesting. And now let me quickly walk you through some experiments that we've done. I, I don't want to go into too much detail because otherwise I'm going to take too long. Um, but effectively what you see here is we made these nanobeams also out of gallium arsenide here. We have a relatively big IDT here essentially where we create a surface acoustic wave in this case and, and launch this towards this, this nanobeam that then excites this mechanical motion at gigahertz frequency that we can then read out optically. And this was kind of a first proof of concept um, experiment to show that this can actually be used for um, microwave to optics conversion. And the good thing here is we can really work with the mechanical system in the ground state. So you don't add any, any thermal noise, any classical noise to your transduction. So this is really a noiseless um, process effectively. Um, we can also show that this process is actually fully coherent. Um, so you really preserve the phase in, the, in this transduction process. Um, and the efficiency actually now is, I already told you the important thing here is the cooperativity. So this is actually proportional to the input power, to the optical input power, at least on the optomechanical side. So the stronger you, you drive your, your, your red sideband here, the, the high efficiency you have in reading out. And this is simply because it's a parametric process, it's a beam splitter um, interaction that you can use. Now, the bad thing about gallium arsenide is actually um, very, um, absorptive. It's not really absorptive, but it's, it has a little bit of residual absorption that you see if you increase your optical power, you actually very quickly start heating your mechanical system. So this is really what you don't want. You don't want to introduce noise in, the, in, the, in your conversion. Now, to have efficient um, conversion also, you, you kind of have to have a large index of refraction. This goes hand in hand with the coupling rate. So higher index of refraction means higher optomechanical coupling rate. And at the same time, we were looking at, for something that was similar to gallium arsenide in terms of index of perfection, but had a higher band gap energy. And what we found actually is gallium phosphide as a very similar material. Also, the processing is very similar. And then when we looked at this um, and directly compared it, we could actually see we could really increase the optical power significantly further than with gallium arsenide, 
and still stay at low thermal occupation. So we, we realized that this is a really nice material to, to use for this transduction process. Now we, we wanted to go away from the surface acoustic waves and, and effectively make new types of resonators. So here we have this nano beam structure and then we just add um, this kind of extra block resonator here that we can drive electrically. So we can put some electrodes on here. We can drive a piezoelectric um, excitation here that then is a super mode together with the mechanical, um, with the mechanical motion of this nano beam. And the way this looks like, this is symmetric and an anti-symmetric super mode. And they actually couple quite nicely. They, I think, have, have, a, have a coupling of, of a few megahertz or so typically. So this, is, this works quite well. And you can, you can relatively easily um, make this in your, um, in your um, clean room. Um, now, in order to drive this, you would ideally want to have an electrode on top on the bottom. This is very hard in, in fabrication. So what we did is we did the next best thing. So we had like in-plane just two, um, two, two grounds. And then in the center, we had just had a conductor and just through the fields going through the here, the field lines going um, from the bottom into the into piezo electric could actually drive this, this mode. Um, the problem is always um, you have to do some sort of now electric um, matching circuit. You kind of have to, to match your impedances in, in these circuits. Um, otherwise, you have very, very little driving that you can do, for example, with a microwave source or with a qubit. Um, for this, you, you, we build an LC resonator, essentially effectively matches the, the, the impedances. Um, this is what this looks like in reality. So you have a, quite a big um, LC resonator. So this is, um, this is essentially just a, a superconductor with a big pad in the middle where we can then wire bond on top. And then you see the signal goes down here. And this is your, your nanobeam here, a little bit magnified. So you have this block resonator here and the nanobeam. And then here comes the optical part, this, this um, grayish, yellowish, um, Part here is the ground, and in the middle here is the is the is the signal that you can that you can use to drive this this block resonator. Now we we've seen that that the super mode actually works quite well. We see some some nice splitting between the between the block resonator mode and the and the nano beam mode, and this is um, what our our data right now looks like. So you see there's like the the anti symmetric and the symmetric mode, and this is really an electro optic transduction signal. So you see that you can quite a nice strong signal at around the resonance frequency of your super mode. So we really see nice transduction between microwave and optics in these kind of resonators. The efficiency, I, I didn't talk about this before with the surface acoustic waves with only 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12. We now are about 10 to the minus six or 10 to the minus seven um, with these kind of structures. It's still not quite where we want it to be. So we think we still need a slightly stronger superconductor, uh, not superconductor, um, piezoelectric material. So also go away from from gallium phosphide, we're thinking of using lithium niobate um, as, an, as an even stronger piezoelectric and then potentially boost this efficiency by, by two or three orders of magnitude or so. But then we should really be able to get into a regime where the cooperativities are large enough to do, to do interesting conversion where we can potentially even convert a single microwave photon to a single optical photon. All right, with this, um, I, wanna, I wanna finish. This is, this is my group before the pandemic. Um, they, it all looks a little bit different now. And I also want to thank my collaborators. And last but not least, I, I also want to make a small advertisement. We recently actually, with this um, microwave to optics um, transaction, we actually started a startup company, a spin-off from my group. Um, if you're interested, have a look at our website and, and shoot us an email. And thanks for your attention. I'm very much looking forward to more questions now. <laughs>